Chi, I'm from Taipei, Taiwan, and I'm a lawyer and now working at the um, here in, in Midtown. So actually, I'm nervous to see in between of two experts in U.S.-Taiwan relations. So um, it's my honor to introduce to you Julia. Actually, Alisa, me, and Julia and Jenny met four years ago at a Taiwanese event, and ever since we have been very good friends. And well, actually, we see each other in like all kinds of Taiwanese events. Um, so Julia is a modern historian. Um, she's specialized. She specializes in modern East, East and Central Asian studies. And um, especially Taiwan, Tibet, Tibet, uh, and East Tur Turkestan, Dong Tu Jue, or we say, uh, we got Tu Jue, Xinjiang. They don't want to say Xinjiang on the Chinese perspective. Because it's like new All territory of China. Uh, so it's like, it's we got mm -hmm. And then also, she, well, actually, she's, her resume is really amazing. Um, she's a research affiliate at the Project 2049. It's a think tank in Washington, D.C. And she's also now a visiting scholar at Yale University, International Security Studies. And she's a PhD candidate at Georgetown um, his History Department. Master, and a lot of you are from Columbia University. Um, she's a math, she got her master in Eastern Asian Studies from Columbia University. And she also got her BA uh, from Harvard for the college. Also, she was a Fulbright Fellow from 2007, uh, 2007 to 2008 in Taiwan. And her study was in historical development and ethno-nationalism. So she knows a lot about Taiwan, and she has a lot of first experience in Taiwan. And in addition to many papers published on academic journals, uh, she's also a contributor to national interest and the diplomat. She recently just gave a very wonderful talk to at the American Enterprise Institute. It's also a think tank in Washington, D.C. So now, without further ado, I think I will give the floor to Julia. So thank you so much for having me tonight. It's really great to be back in New York. I was telling the listen paper, my family is actually originally from Mott Street. Grandfather, great grandfather grew up on Mott Street, moved to Hell's Kitchen. So for me, going to Columbia was kind of like a homecoming. So, uh, but but first, you know, I also really want to thank our tech crew who managed to get, get this up. I guess well, maybe we'll have to turn off lights or something. Oh. Um, but um, uh, but yeah, yeah but, uh, but it, yeah, and we're working on it forever. So I'm I'm very impressed with their skills. Um, anyway, so what I'm going to try and achieve tonight is address a number of different issues because I know people have very different backgrounds in Taiwan, in U.S.-Taiwan relations. So uh, basically I'm going to break the presentation down into three parts. The first part is going to talk about some historical issues, uh, look at the communique framework, the Taiwan Relations Act, because the problem with the framework and the TRA is that a lot of people cite it all the time, but not a lot of people actually understand. A lot, not a lot of people understand it. It's misquoted, misunderstood constantly. Uh, you know, even people who are government officials in the United States will misquote it. So I really wanted to break it down. If you can bear with me, so we can all talk about it, um, think about it, so that we can um, inform others the way the system functions. Uh, secondly. I'm going to talk about um, some oft-quoted misconceptions about Taiwan, things that you'll hear all the time in the press from Chinese officials, you know, all different places, and we'll talk about um, how, how to think about these issues so that, again, uh, you know, we can represent Taiwan um, to others in a way that is more fitting with perhaps some of our perspectives. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to spend the last part of the presentation specifically addressing uh, the, the, the bilateral relationship in the present time and how we can improve the relationship in the future. Uh, so I'll make you know, very specific recommendations uh, on how to improve the relationship, how to improve the policies, and things we should be thinking about as we talk to our representatives um, you know, on, on Capitol Hill and, and beyond. Um, so do we need to turn off the light in front, or I? Yeah. yeah. Everybody, don't go to it. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> is is that 
good enough? Can you see? Yeah. Okay, that's good, because then I can, when I have to read stuff, I can do that too. Okay. Um, so, basically, we have this idea that the greatest obstacle to discovery is not ignorance, it is rather the illusion of knowledge. I think that's, um, you know, perfect when it comes to Taiwan, because there are so many misconceptions out there, uh, so much false information. Uh, so, there's a lot of misperceptions that the general public and policymakers alike have about Taiwan, and over time, these misperceptions evolve into commonly held truths that inform conventional thinking and subsequently affect the process of decision making, both in the United States and in Taiwan. So we therefore must not only understand the, these important issues, but also explain them clearly and logically to others as a means of misspelling or dispelling misperceptions. So first, as I said, I'm going to break down the One China Policy, the Communicate Framework, and the Taiwan Relations Act, because these are really key documents that uh, a lot of people don't quite get right. So um, again, if you can't see, I'll just kind of read. It's a little difficult. Um, so the so-called One China Policy reflects neither international realities nor the interests of the United States. Uh, it's important to remember that the People's Republic of China has never controlled Taiwan. Taiwan is a sovereign country that deserves its inherent and democratic right to self-determination. But what exactly is the United States One China policy? Uh, in order to explain the situation of Taiwan to others, to advocate for Taiwan, whatever your personal goal is, it's critical to examine this question in more depth. Uh, so the United States One China policy arose from the Communicate K Framework, as well as the Taiwan Relations Act. Uh, and these are both instrumental in shaping American policy towards Taiwan. However, uh, the Communicate Framework, as I mentioned, is not only vastly important, but also vastly misunderstood and misinterpreted. Also, although some people mistakenly see the joint communiques as U.S. recognition that Taiwan is part of China, the truth is actually much more complicated and nuanced. It's thus necessary to examine parts of this framework in, in more depth. First of all, the Chinese government states clearly its position in the 1972 jo joint communique. The government of the People's Republic of China is the sole legal government of China. Taiwan is a province of China, which has long been returned to the motherland. The liberation of Taiwan is China's internal affair in which no other country has the right to interfere. The Chinese government firmly opposes any activities which aim at the creation of one China, one Taiwan, one China, two governments, two Chinas, an independent Taiwan, or advocate that the status of Taiwan remains to be determined. So the Chinese position actually is the clearer one. The US one is a little messier. <laughs> uh, OK, so second of all, the U.S. government makes the following statement in 1979. The United States of America recognizes the government of the People's Republic of China as the sole legal government of China. The government of the United States of America acknowledges the Chinese position that there is one, but one China and Taiwan is a part of China. So is that clear or is it not? Okay. <laughs> So, upon close examination of the U.S. statement, two things are extremely clear. First, while the U.S. government recognizes that the Chinese government is the legitimate government of the People's Republic of China, it is left to interpretation exactly what constitutes China. Does the Chinese government have legitimate legal dis jurisdiction over mainland China only, or over Taiwan as well? The document does not attempt to answer this question. Sec yeah. what, what, what year was this document? This one was 79. 79. This was a joint communique in 79. Uh, second, although the Chinese declare that Taiwan is part of China, the United States never formally agrees with that statement. Instead, the Americans merely acknowledge the Chinese position, which is equivalent to saying, I hear you, I hear you, I understand what you're saying, but I don't necessarily agree. Um, so that allows the United States to refrain from making a specific pronouncement on the issue. Therefore, people who claim that the communique framework is somehow a definitive commentary on the U.S. position towards Taiwan are, are mistaken. 
So this kind of allows the U.S. to have some legal wiggle room. But anyone who says that the U.S. position is that Taiwan is part of China, that, that's not actually what the document says. So talk a little bit about that history. After secret negotiations between the United States and Chinese leaders, uh, Jimmy Car Carter formally recognized China on January 1st, 1979. Um, you know, if you watch the videos, uh, I mean, it was kind of chaotic in Taiwan. You'd see people running after the ambassador's car as it was leaving, you know, throwing things at it. Uh, it really came to um, Americans and Taiwanese as, as a great shock. A lot of people were not expecting it. Um, Congress, of course, was absolutely infuriated uh, because it was not consulted on the matter. And, and the Congress was also really upset because they felt that this unilateral decision left Taiwan abandoned and unprotected. Uh, this viewpoint was shared by the United <coughs> States public, which did not want to sacrifice its support for Taiwan in order to normalize relations with the People's Republic of China. Therefore, legislators subsequently passed the Taiwan Relations Act by a near unanimous vote. I believe it was, might have been the guy from South Carolina who didn't vote for it. I think he was basically the um, grand Paul of his day, but um, one, I think one person didn't vote for it. Uh, so that it took effect immediately once formal relations with the islands were separate. The island was separate. Uh, the TRA states that it is in the best interests of the United States to maintain peace, security, and stability in the Asia Pacific region, and fully pledges to maintain unofficial relations with Taiwan through commercial, cultural, and other spheres. It further states that the United States predicates its decision to normalize relations with China on the expectation that Taiwan's future will be decided peacefully. And that plays such a huge role in our, our policy today. Uh, the United States declares its right to provide Taiwan with defensive weapons and will react with serious concern if any attempt is made to determine Taiwan's status by non-peaceful measures. Unsurprisingly, the Chinese government expressed its extreme displeasure over the act and regarded its passage as utterly, utterly contrary to the spirit of the communique framework. However, an American precondition for establishment of diplomatic relations with China was that the U.S. maintain the ability uh, thank you, uh, to maintain informal links with Taiwan. Due to the separation of powers clause in the U.S. Constitution, President Carter could escape blame by maintaining that he couldn't stop Congress from creating such a policy. In reality, the Congressional Act allowed the passage of a resolution that would otherwise prove difficult for a sitting president to enact given diplomatic pressures. So the Chinese complain about this all the time, you know, that they complain, complain about uh, diplomatic trickery, the separation of powers, but it, it's, and this is the same thing when, you know, um, Lee Dong Kui came to the United States. Clinton tried to block him from coming. Congress overturned it, gave him a visa. So this has played out a number of times over the years, uh, much to Taiwan's advantage. So January 1st marked the 35th anniversary of the Taiwan Relations Act. So now is a great time not only to thank Congress for its historic support for the safety and security of the Taiwanese people, but also, them, also ask them to reconsider the One China policy. It's a policy that neither reflects the democratic ideals and values of the United States, nor adequately protects the interests of the people of Taiwan. Okay, so I think from The Economist. Um, so the second part of the presentation, uh, as I mentioned, is, is this idea of shattering conventional wisdom. Uh, people will often throw things at you all, but Taiwan's always been part of China, or Taiwan's rocking the boat, or Taiwan's doing this, and you know, and you want to be able to really think about how to respond to these, these type of statements. Um, some are made by maybe US officials, some are made by Chinese officials, uh, you know, some are maybe made by just confused American citizens. So I wanted to address some of these ideas and the ways in which we can articulate our ideas. So, falsehood number one is that Taiwan has always been an inseparable part of China. This idea, Taiwan's a good idea, it's 
Like, you'll hear that over and over and over again when you go to China. Um, so, I'm not going to go over this too much, um, but a lot of you probably know the history, you know, this idea that Aboriginal peoples have, or Austronesian peoples have lived in Taiwan for at least 6,000 years. There are different ideas of how far the history goes back. Um, you know, the Qin marked the beginning of Imperial China. Uh, at this point, Imperial leaders saw Taiwan as incredibly unimportant. They did not pay attention to China. Uh, foreigners began arriving in Taiwan during the Age of Exploration. The Portuguese, the Spanish, uh, the, and the Dutch East India Company all administered the island during various points in the 15 and 1600s. Taiwan, and this is really important to remember, because if you see maps with Taiwan from the Han or the Qing Dynasty, they're fabricated. Taiwan does not appear on an imperial map until 1683. Uh, after the Qing leaders grew concerned that Ming loyalists and pirates had moved their base of operations to Taiwan. Uh, so the Kangxi Emperor himself, uh, at this time the Kangxi Emperor declared uh, that Taiwan was a ball of mud beyond the pale of civilization. So the only reason the Chinese the only reason the Chinese government even became concerned about Taiwan in the first place because of Ming loyalists and pirates who had moved their base of operations to Taiwan. So until the beginning of the Qing, it wasn't even on their radar, and they wanted it control of it only for strategic and security reasons. But Kangxi said it was a ball of mud beyond the pale of civilization. There was nothing about Taiwan itself that they cared about or wanted. So this idea that Taiwan was somehow always important to China or always part of China is not borne out by the historical record. So I always laugh when I see Han Dynasty maps produced with Taiwan on them because they didn't even pay attention to Taiwan back then. Um, so after Taiwan was attacked during the Opium Wars, it was only then that the Qing designated Taiwan as a province in 1885. So up until that, it was kind of like an appendage of Fujian, but it wasn't even treated as an actual province. Um, but by this time, the empire was already in decline. So when the Sino-Japanese War broke out, and Taiwan was permanently ceded to the Japanese in the Treaty of Shimonoseki, uh, that's when you began to see the period of Japanese colonization from 1895 to 1945. So basically, the only years that Taiwan was technically a province of China, or really the Qing Dynasty, which was controlled by the Manchus, it was a Manchu Empire, was from 1885 to 1895. That's it. So, um, so about 10 years. So the Chinese are basing all these claims um, on a 10-year period uh, based on a dynasty that they didn't even control. So it's, you know... Um, so kind of like I think with the Philippines trying to claim Puerto Rico because they were originally an appendage of the United States, it, you know, it's it's kind of faulty logic. So then um, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Chiang Kai-shek agreed during the 1943 Cairo conference that once they defeated Japan, they would force it to release Taiwan, Manchuria, and the Pescadores and return them to the Republic of China and the subsequent July 1945 Potsdam Declaration reaffirmed these demands. Um, a lot of you know about the 228 massacre that uh, occurred on February 27, 1947, uh, when an elderly woman was selling black market cigarettes uh, in defiance of the state monopoly. Uh, I think she, she got uh, hit in the head with, like, with a rifle, or she, she was beaten and riots ended up breaking out in, in Taiwan. And for those of you who don't know the history, uh, an entire generation of leaders was subsequently slaughtered. Uh, teachers, lawyers, uh, politicians, anyone who could potentially stand up to Chiang Kai-shek was systematically slaughtered, imprisoned. So no one knows for sure the exact numbers. I've heard 20 to 30,000 people. It's, it's difficult to say. Um, but the museum in Kaohsiung actually has a pretty good exhibition, and um, the new Jingmei Museum in, in um, New Taipei City is, is pretty good, too. Um, so anyway, the government subsequently declared martial law, 
And uh, up until recently, Taiwan had had the dubious honor of having the world's longest martial law uh, from 1948 <laughs> to 1987. Uh, and then the subsequent period of the White Terror um, really saw um, many more leaders um, put into prison, both in Green Island, in Jingmei, and in, in other locations around Taiwan. Um, again, going quickly through some of this history as a background, um, when Mao Zedong came to power, he tried to liberate Taiwan, and his plan was to, to invade Taiwan until the Korean War broke out in 1950. And that's the point at which Harry Truman decided to send troops to Korea and the 7th Fleet to the Taiwan Strait. The U.S. government figured out what was going on, and they sent the 7th Fleet to make sure that Mao didn't use the war in Korea as an excuse to try and attack Taiwan when the international community was distracted. Um, now, one of the most important documents that you might have heard of is the San Francisco Peace Treaty. The Japanese and Americans signed the San Francisco Peace Treaty on September 8, 1951. The Japanese agreed to abandon all right, title, and claim to Taiwan without designating a beneficiary. Some American officials had begun to worry that Chiang Kai-shek was, surprise, surprise, an unreliable ally who would never retake the mainland, as he promised. And the decision is akin to granting the KMT guardianship, but not ownership, of Taiwan. The treaty thus renders the status of Taiwan undetermined in the eyes of the United States. This is where our policy stems from. It goes all the way back to the San Francisco Peace Treaty. So anyone who says that uh, this treaty gave Taiwan back to the ROC is not quite accurate. It, all it specified was that Ta Japan must relinquish its claims to Taiwan, but it did not say who owned, so to speak, the island. It didn't make it independent. It didn't make it part of China. It, it, it gave the KMT stewardship of Taiwan. So. Uh, again, this is something that's often misquoted, but um, the treaty is actually much more nuanced than, than a lot of people think. The, the United States subsequently um, signed its mutual defense treaty with Taiwan in 1954, and it was abrogated when the U.S. switched recognition to China in 1979. So that's why a lot of times today, officials will say Taiwan is an important partner. We generally won't use the word ally. Um, we might say democratic ally, but not ally, because the military treaty was abrogated in 79. A um, couple, couple last important dates. Um, Taiwan gained entry into the WTO as an independent customs territory. Um, the United States actually did a pretty good job there. They told China they would not allow it to join the WTO unless Taiwan could join too. Um, so, they both joined about the same time, around 2000, 1999-2000, and as separate entities. Uh, and finally, the Ch CCP promulgated its so-called anti-secession law in 2005, uh, declaring that it would declare, or, yeah, saying it would declare war on Taiwan, uh, unless the, the island formally declared, or excuse me, unless it renounced independence. Um, and rejoin China or join China, depending on how you want to think about it. Um, but the, the thing that people don't really realize about the 2005 anti-secession law is it also reserves the right to attack Taiwan if it tries to postpone reunification indefinitely. So basically, Hu Jintao said, look, we can ta attack you if you declare independence, but we can also attack you if the status quo drags on too long which is an often ignored clause of this, of this so-called law. Um, and that goes against what we were just talking about. It goes against the TRA, in which the United States says, look, we only recognize China because we have the expectation this would be resolved peacefully. So this actually goes against the communique framework, the, the TRA. It goes against uh, the United States' previously existing laws and agreements with China. Uh, so this is kind of China in a sense, uh, reneging on uh, what it, it promised the United States. Um, so, falsehood number two, the concept of the status quo is still a valid policy for the United States. 
what exactly is the status quo? It's a term that's thrown around a lot, but what does it actually mean? Um, I mean, the practical de di dictionary definition is simply the existing state of affairs, especially regarding social or political issues. However, defining what constitutes the present prostrate status quo depends largely upon one's perspective. The United States views Taiwan as a de facto independent polity, and Columbia and the Nathan used to love to throw that around all the time. Well, it's a de facto independent polity um, that exercises control over its own domestic and foreign affairs. It believes that any permanent solution of the cross-strait question must be negotiated in an environment free of coercion and with the assent of the Taiwanese people. This is a very important component of US policy towards Taiwan. Uh, there cannot be unified by force, and any decision has to be made with the assent of the Taiwanese people. So basically, the US policy is, if one day, let's say China becomes democratic, Taiwan wants to become part of China, that's the choice of the Taiwanese people. It's not our choice. We shouldn't have a role in that decision. It's the choice of the Taiwanese people. But that decision must be made without the threat of coercion. So that, that's kind of the, the thought process there. The PRC views Taiwan as a province separated from the Chinese motherland by civil war. It believes that Taiwan will invariably reunite with China. The status quo, thus, in China's perspective, is only temporary. So in the US position, it could theoretically be indefinite. In the Chinese version, the status quo is temporary. So already we see two different versions of what the status quo means, what the status quo implies. Uh, former Taiwanese President Chen shui bian has conversely stated that Taiwan is already an independent country. As such, there is no need to declare independence. Therefore, Taiwan is a country and independence is the status quo. So we have three entirely different definitions of what the status quo means. So people throw around this term a lot, but you have to stop and say, well, okay, whose definition are you using? What context are you using it in? Um, so it gets really complicated. So you probably heard this a million times during the Chen administration in particular, US officials and policy experts commonly argued that Taiwan was setting the status quo or more colloquially phrased, rocking the boat. For example, you might remember that Secretary of State Rice censured the administration's 2004 election referenda. She argued that the referenda were unnecessary and provocative. However, neither of the referenda questions dealt with sensitive issues such as sovereignty or independence. The first asked whether Taiwan should acquire more advanced anti-missile weapons should China refuse to pronounce the use of force and withdraw its missiles. The second question asked whether the government should enter into negotiations with China to establish a peace and stability framework. The United States has accused Taiwan of failing to properly strengthen its own defensive capabilities. It also accused the Chen administration of failing to create a stable cross-strait environment. Yet when the government attempted to publicly address these issues through the use of peaceful democratic referenda, the US decried its tactics as provocative. So again, we have a contradiction here.